thank you very much, Stuart, for the invitation to, to come and speak about this. And health inequality is an utterly crucial issue, um, one that's not talked about enough. It just doesn't quite get through too often. Uh, I have a slightly different relation. I, to me, I sort of grew up uh, at home talking about health inequality, thinking about it. It really shaped my own political views, my life as it develops. Uh, I should confess part of the reason is, and it's lovely to hear Michael Mama talk about so much, he's actually my uncle. So I really did grow up talking about this sort of thing all the time. Um, I was, perhaps there were a number of times I had heard a bit too much about the white studies at times. <laughs> um, but it is something which has just always been there for me. And so those six things are, uh, are regular things that, that he and I talked about. And um, we talked a number of times while I was an MP about how to achieve some of those uh, things. Um, so it's something which I've cared about. It's also, it was lovely to hear Stuart um, mention Joseph Roundtree. Um, I feel it's particularly appropriate to mention since we're here in a Quaker meeting house. I've, I'm also a recently appointed director of the Joseph Roundtree Reform Trust, so trying to carry on some of the Roundtree work. Uh, I've so far been appointed about two weeks, so I can't claim any achievements yet, but I hope there will be some. One thing I want to say very clearly is that, as Stuart mentioned, I've just been reselected to stand for Parliament again for the Lib Dems. I really don't want this to become a party political thing at all, partly because it's really frustrating sometimes when that happens. And I remember back in late 2010, I think it was, there was a debate about youth unemployment in Parliament. Um, and at one point, quite a long way through, I was sort of standing towards the back, talking to Lisa Nandy, who's an extremely good Labour MP, some of you may have come across. And we were obviously paying attention, but also finding time to chat. Um, and I don't remember now which of us said it to the other, we were both thinking at the same time. Every speech from the opposition said, youth unemployment is far too high, and it's the government's fault. And every speech from the government side said, youth unemployment is far too high, and it's the last government's fault. And nobody from any side was saying anything about, what do we do about it? And it's frustrating, and I don't want to see what happens far too often in some of these party political fights, that it's, uh, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, let's fix it. Let's not argue about that. So as I said, it's a hugely key issue, and it's clearly utterly unacceptable we have these sorts of health inequality differences. I mean, there's no way they can be acceptable anywhere. Uh, you, you, there's one of the famous figure, but as you go, every step you go on the Jubilee line away from Westminster costs you a year of your life. You know? How is that acceptable? I think the gap in Glasgow is 14 years, something like that. How is that possibly acceptable? It's even worse over cities. You know, that we're talking here about inequality within Cambridge, but actually the fact that there are people in countries around who have much shorter life expectancies is also utterly utterly unacceptable. And for me, this is again a slightly core philosophical point, I'll just diverge slightly. Um, I'm a, very much a Rawlsian liberal. I don't know if you all know Rawls, I haven't read by any sort of everything he did. But there's one idea which I love, and apologies, if you were listening to Radio Cambridge here at 6.20 in the morning a couple of Sundays ago, you'd have heard me on the Faith Programme talking about this. Any takers for people who are up at 6.20? I don't think so. Uh, it was pre recorded. But there's this wonderful idea of a veil of ignorance. Uh, the rules came up with. And the other is, how do you work out what a fair, just society would look like? And his idea was that we would all gather together before we come into the world, it's a bit of a conceptual thing, it's hard to actually do, and work out what is fair and what isn't fair before we know who we will be. So before you know whether you'll be male or female, whether you'll live here or in Syria, you know, whether you'll come from a rich family or a poor family, before you know any of that, we work out what will be a fair system. Would anybody think it was okay that you might randomly be drawn for the you'll die early card? There's no way that we do it. So it's clearly not a just thing to do. And the problems in Cambridge is this wonderful report really sets out clearly are, are, are just too bad. You know, anything that is worse than no life expectancy difference between ward areas like that is just, in my view, unacceptably bad. We won't have everybody living exactly the same amount of time, but the average is by areas. There's no reason why wealth should get you extra years of life. There's no reason why wealth should get you extra years of healthy, non-disabled life. There's just no reason for that. Um, in my day job at the moment, I'm an academic at the University of Cambridge looking at public policy, and we do some work with YouGov, and we had a conference recently about inequality, uh, which was fascinating, Stuart and I were chatting uh, there, so you'll know what I'm about to say, and we've done some surveying of people and what they think is acceptable. But it's quite clear that most of the public do not think it is acceptable for there to be a life expectancy gap that's based on that. Good. The public are on side on this, they're not on everything. And it becomes even worse, it's not just that how long you live is related to where you live, 
because we have such a huge problem with social mobility, and have done for many, many decades and centuries, how long you live depends on where your parents lived. You know, we, we get into this vicious cycle which traps people. At birth, people are being dealt with poorly simply because we have an unfair system. We absolutely have to break that. So it applies at every single level. If you're um, are born in a poor area, if you're a poor family, you generally get less good education. You get less good education, you get less good prospects, you know, and so on. It keeps cycling. We utterly, we have to change that, we have to fix that. Um, and to do that, just to come back to, to the issue about health itself, um, I can talk about education for a while, but that's another subject you might want to talk about later. Part of the challenge, and part of the whole point of the Marmot work, is that you have to go broader than just looking at health, as it's been classically considered. And, uh, Michael did a Desert Island Discs, which was really quite interesting when he talked about a lot about this. It's worth, worth listening to. And he described the experience of having patients come in, and he'd patch whatever the short-term problem was, give them antibiotics or whatever, and then send them back to unacceptable living conditions. And he felt it was getting pointless just to sort of go through the medical cycle. So yes, we have to make sure that health is delivered in an equitable, fair way. Um, actually, we have a lot to be proud of here, because um, the NHS is rated, turning the last survey I saw, as the most equally accessible health service anywhere in the world, better than Denmark, better than anywhere else. You know, no matter how much money it is, you have access. That's brilliant. We have to keep that. That's one reason why I get very annoyed when I see some of the stupid suggestions from various politicians of, sadly, left and right, that we should start charging for access. As soon as you do that, we'll lose that crap. Like, you know, I'm so proud we have an NHS that everybody can go and use. But any intervention that's done at that stage is almost too late. I take the risk of being corrected by Tony, but probably one of the biggest things that helped with health was proper sanitation. That's not something which a doctor would do. It's not what you'd technically say is, is the Department of Health's responsibility, but it saved more lives, made more difference than anything else. That's where you have to look. And that is exactly the, the point about about my work. So it's about social services. I used to go on the county council, and one thing which I found really annoying was there's been pressures in budgets, you know, every single year from 2001, there was always not enough money and so forth. And what would happen is that time and time again, the work would be focused just on people in the highest need. And when you do that, you start focusing on people in the highest need, you don't help the people whose needs aren't so bad at the moment, you wait until they get to a really high level of need. So it ends up costing you much more, as well as being much worse for them. Why would you do something which is worse for people and more expensive? You know, an utterly absurd way to do things. So we have to try to get more into prevention, getting social services to help people as early as possible, help people. There are ways of empowering people so they can look after some of their conditions earlier before it's necessary to do bigger, more expensive things. And sometimes you just have to provide more support that is going to cost more, but let's try to reduce the need for that. Housing is a huge issue. We've already heard quite a lot from, from Stuart and Tony about housing, and it's absolutely true. People in poor quality housing and we do have far too much poor quality housing around Cambridge. Some of the council stock, some it's now being knocked down and replaced. Utterly atrocious quality. And I've been into places around Cambridge which you, you can see why people are not healthy when they live in. Big problem now in the private rented sector. There's been some steps to try to improve that, but there are still parts of the private rented sector that are just simply not fit for people to be living in in this sort of time. Um, and problems with people being overcrowded. All of those problems make things worse. Um, the living wage was touched on as well, you know, hugely important to make sure that when people are in work, and I agree with everything that's been said about it, it's not true that people who are poor are the ones who don't have jobs. Not having a job is not a helpful thing, <laughs> um, but let's make sure that people can actually earn a decent amount. Um, the earlier was talked about all the way about citizens' income, which is something I'm actually very interested in. I think it's uh, doing some work with various people to try and look at ways of making it all work, because it is important to get it right, there's been some interesting pilots. Um, but I think it is going to be the right way forward. Again, how technology will start to change employment is another subject. I don't have time to, to bore you on that right now. Um, the Whitehall 2 study, another of Michael Marmot's pieces, one of the things that came out of that was that one of the biggest factors that makes people unwell is stress, is insecurity, is lack of control over their own lives. So anything that makes people be insecure, whether it's insecure unemployment, insecure housing, anything else, is hugely deleterious. Mental health is another bitch, back to people with mental health problems. We know that one in four of us will have a serious mental health problem at some point in our lives. 
but for decades, centuries, generations, we've just sort of ignored it and sort of, you know, it, oh, you're depressed, oh, well, try and be happy. You know, it doesn't work like that, uh, and that causes huge problems. I think there's also an issue that too many doctors and people in medical professions think really look at health as being defined by ill health, disease. And actually, much more about helping people to flourish, helping so that people aren't on the border of disease, but have moved a long way back. We can change the way that works. I think there's also a big factor about how we judge success in society. Um, I've probably spoken for too long, so I won't say too much about this, but uh, and again, this is a 6.20 in the morning program on another week. Um, we have this national obsession with GDP. And GDP is an atrocious measure of anything we should actually care about. Um, if we were to smash this room up, I'm not suggesting we do, and then it gets fixed, GDP has gone up. <laughs> is that in any sense a good thing? If you develop lung cancer and get treatment by the NHS, GDP is higher than it would have been if you never developed the lung cancer. How is this a good thing? Um, the big BP oil spill contributed massively to GDP, global GDP, because all the costs of cleaning it all up again. It'd be much better if it never spilled in the first place. GDP is utterly the wrong measure. So something I spent five years trying to push on was the idea of looking at well-being economics. Let's look at things that actually matter to people's lives. Make people's lives count, not GDP. GDP is also very unequal and unfair because it means that if you take £1,000 away from somebody who has very little and give £2,000 to somebody who's already a millionaire, GDP has gone up. I think most of us would prefer it to go the other way around and that would have more benefits to people's lives. I can do another 10 minutes on that, but I will spend it. I was asked to talk about what the CCG uh, can do, so I will actually do what I'm told to do. Um, and the CCG has only limited ability to do things. So, for those of you who don't know what a CCG is in our bizarre system, um, we fund secondary health care across Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. So we spend about a billion pounds hiring Adam Brooks, hiring various other people. We don't directly commission public health. That's done by the councils. But there are some things that we do. I want us, as I've been pushing for, to look much more about improving access to the NHS services, particularly in some of the more rural areas of Cambridgeshire where it may be that you know, you'll get free treatment if you can get there, but if you can't get there, that doesn't help very much. Um, and putting more resources into GDP surgeries and other things in areas where there is high deprivation. But that's only part of it. And a lot more is that preventative agenda. Uh, we talked about health prevention. There is a Cambridge and Peterborough health prevention strategy. My view, and I've said this publicly before, is I don't think it's anything like ambitious enough. There are resource constraints on the NHS. We need more money. And money is being saved in all the wrong places. Money is being saved by, for example, not giving nurses the pay rise that the independent panel said they should get. That's the wrong way to save money. I would much rather save money by, for example, intervening early to help people not to need dialysis. You know, there are loads of things within the NHS where we can save money and actually make people healthier. That, I think, has to be the way forward. The other thing within the CCG that is a huge passion of mine uh, is mental health. And uh, mental health is a huge cause of some of the problems that we have here for mental health. Um, just to give you an idea, when I joined the CCG, um, the waiting time for child and adolescent mental health was 47 weeks. I have annoyed, I think, all of my colleagues on it by banging on about it at every meeting. Um, and thanks for their good work, you know, I'm a non-executive, I don't do this, it's now down to about 14 weeks. That's still too long. 14 weeks is a lot better than 47 weeks. Um, so the CCG can do a lot in those areas, but what it has to be about is looking at the whole system. One of the things we're just doing now, it's just gone on our website, uh, is having a much larger plan across Cambridge and Peterborough to work with the council to work with all of these facilities, because the best way to reduce their health inequalities is to make everybody better off, to alleviate these problems, to fix the challenges. So. I'm really pleased that we have this report. I'm really pleased that people are talking about it. It's a shame there aren't more people here. But it's something which I hope all of us will keep talking about. Um, and it will be lovely to keep seeing you, hopefully for not too long, until we get the lists down and we can start to say, actually, health inequality is something more of the past. I think we'll be seeing each other for a few years yet, sadly. <laughs>
your talk about the NHS being great enabled and free access. Actually, no one I know above a certain profession level would take a job without private health insurance, and that lets you jump the queue enormously. It's a massive difficulty. I mean, it's, it's not as bad here as in many places. Um, and so I do know people who are well paid who, as a matter of course, use the NHS. Yeah. Yeah. As an MP, I mean, I thought I was well paid, I wasn't well paid by him. <laughs> a lot of times, I would never even dream of being quite a cover. Yeah, the job. The job the contract. Well, the most companies are okay. But I, mean, I think there is a problem if people start separating themselves from that whole universalism becomes a really big factor. People don't feel part of it. But actually, people do feel part of it. Even people who, who do have, I think, come. It, it's what they have, but they still could get treated better. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. It, it increases the quality. Agreed. Agreed. We'll, we'll see about Theresa May. It's a bit early to be certain, but I have had my own sensations. Uh, I haven't yet heard of her announcements about um, allowing housing associations not to be forced to sell homes on them, for example. There's um, some argument, it'll be interesting to see whether it works, I, and I genuinely don't know, that so much of public health is about fixing people's environments. That actually having the people doing public health with the people who are doing the stuff about the environments helps. So there is a challenge. How do you have public health in the health bit? But also, and it works better in single-tier authorities, I think. If, you're, if you want as a public health person to do something about housing, working in the same place as the person who does stuff about housing is going to give you that chance to say, now hang on, have you thought about these things? But as soon as you're in a different agency, you know, you've seen this. <laughs> Getting people to actually talk at that time is hard. So I think the problem wasn't so much that move, that there are because there are problems and benefits from it. It's the fact that it was, it's not protected. Um, and actually, um, investing in public health has huge returns. And nobody really recognises. If you look at the five-year forward view for the NHS, there's a whole set of flaws with that. The amount of money they reckon that can be saved by health prevention is minuscule. It's just not a focus. And we, but we all know that actually you can save huge amounts of money. There's a famous case, um, some remember where it was 10 years ago, I think, where a PCT spent some money on gritting pavements and got a lot of flat for wasting health money. And their point was, well, but it's cheaper to grit the pavements and not have people fall over. So we don't have to fix their legs up. I say, oh, well, but it's the local council's job to do that. It's like, yeah, but they weren't. It's still cheaper. You know, and we have to get that sort of thinking because too often expenses in one bit of the public sector save money in another bit of the public sector and nobody fits it all together. New housing, as it's built, needs to make sure to mix communities together. And I always feel upset when I see a housing area where it's like all the expensive housing here and the affordable housing, there's enough of it over on that side. Always looking a bit cheaper in a slightly nastier area. You know, I want to see mixed communities because, as I understand it, the people that they're all going to be human. Mm -hmm. And you know, let, let's treat like that. And there's one, um, one of the estates uh, around Trump, I can't remember uh, which one, um, the ones who are on the same side as the dollars, where the only difference between the social houses and the non-affordable mm -hmm. houses mm -hmm. is it, it's the meta thing. I lose track of the names all the different bits. <laughs> um, the only difference is that all of the social housing has solar panels, and only some of the private housing does. <laughs> yeah, and I just think, you know, that's actually what you know we shout that you don't, you don't. You, it's okay to have your house next to somebody who has a different income, but you know you're still human. And I'd like to see that sort of thing because actually that would mean that we would have less segregation of people. You discover that yes, everybody is in fact a human.